Hi everybody, I'm back again. Been out for a while, but uh, we're going to do another seminar on pediatric echo for the adult technologist. Um, I'm using a different software program, which I help will, or hope will explain things a little bit easier for you. Um, so we'll get started. This is on Tetralogy of Fallot, which would be probably one of the more common congenital heart defects that we do see. It involves several things, so um, we'll get to explaining it. So, Tetralogy of Fallot, this is the definition for it, um, is a rare condition caused by a combination of four heart defects that are present at birth, so they're congenital. These defects, which affect the structure of the heart, cause oxygen-poor blood to flow out of the heart and to the rest of the body. Infants and children with Tetralogy of Fallot usually have blue-tinged skin because their blood doesn't carry enough oxygen. Tetralogy of Fallot is often diagnosed during infancy or soon after. However, Tetralogy of Fallot might, be detected, might not be detected until later in life in some adults, depending upon the severity of the defects and symptoms. With early diagnosis followed by appropriate surgical treatment, most children and adults who have Tetralogy of Fallot live relatively normal lives, though they need regular medical care throughout life and might have restrictions on exercise. Um, I put down the website where I get this uh, information. This is Mayo Clinic. Um, I'm going to recommend, uh, if you're looking for extra information on a congenital defect or something that I cover that you don't understand, go to the mayoclinic.org site and just type in a search for what you're looking for. Um, I find that Mayo Clinic is not only got a good way of explaining things so that you can understand, but also has a, just a vast knowledge, obviously Mayo Clinic would, but um, for you to kind of tap into. So there's the website if you want to, you know, go to that. You can look at the some of the things. Well, I'm going to show you most of them, but anyhow, that's I'm giving them credit so that they know that I'm not stealing this stuff. I'm actually giving them credit. Okay, some of the symptoms that you'll see with kids with Tetralogy of Fallot. The symptoms vary depending upon the extent of the obstruction of blood flow out of the right ventricle and into the lungs. Children with Tetralogy of Fallot have pulmonary stenosis, sometimes pulmonary atresia. So, obviously if there's not a lot of blood going to the lungs, they're going to have signs and symptoms that may include a bluish coloration of the skin caused by low blood, low by blood low in oxygen, sorry, cyanosis, shortness of breath, and rapid breathing, especially during feeding or exercise. So if they're screaming, you might see some bluing of the, especially like the lips and um, the uh, fingers and toes, um, loss of consciousness, so they can faint if they don't have enough blood going to, especially if they're crying really hard. Um, the exercise on the heart is just too much and they pass out so that the heart rate slows down. Clubbing of the fingers and toes. So if you can imagine what a club looks like, you know, it's got a thin handle on one end and a wide handle on the other. Well, what'll happen is you have an, an abnormal rounded shape of the nail bed. So it kind of looks like a club on the end of a, uh, on the end of it, you know, where it's wide. Um, they'll have poor weight gain because they have trouble feeding. Um, they tire easily during play or exercise. They have irritability, um, which I think anybody would have. Prolonged crying and a heart murmur. Okay, one of the things that we see is called tet spells. Sometimes babies who have tetralogy of flow will suddenly develop deep blue skin, nails, and lips after crying or feeding or when agitated. I just kind of said this, but... These episodes are called TET spells and are caused by a rapid drop in the amount of oxygen in the blood. TET spells are most common in young infants around two to four months old. Toddlers or older children might instinctively squat when, they, when they're short of breath. Squatting increases blood flow to the lungs. Um, it's because I think you're reducing the amount of uh, gravity that is required to get the blood back from the legs to the lungs. So, um, 
And this, of course, is also from Mayo Clinic, which is why I cited them down there. Okay, so here we have a picture of Tetralogy of Fallot, which, uh, if you remember your anatomy, we can look at that first. So you have your left ventricle on this side with the myocardium, and you can see that right here, the ventricular septum stops, and there is a very large hole. This would be a severe Tetralogy of Fallot. And uh, then can see the tricuspid valve, the right ventricle, and you can see where mixing of blood would occur quite readily. Now, the thing that you need for both the VSD, or for Tetralogy of Fallot, is this very large VSD, and this VSD can occur here, it can occur up here, so more near the, the leaflet of the aortic valve, so maybe this part will be cut off and then the septum will resume right here and come down to this point. So it doesn't have to be low, it can be higher too. It's just that it's got to be a sizable VSD, so a pretty good size VSD to make it, you know, make the call of Tetralogy of Fallot. Although I guess there's purists out there who say even a small VSD with pulmonary stenosis at the level of the aortic valve would be called a Tetralogy, but Usually tetralogies have a large VSD because they need the mixing of blood. And the reason why is because they've got this very poor pulmonary valve that does not open. So you can have narrowing of the pulmonary artery going up, which is, you know, right here. So the outflow tract of the right ventricle will be narrowed. And then the valve itself will be narrowed. So the flow going out to the lungs is limited and very stenotic. So you're not going to get the good blood flow to the lungs that you need. Which is why there's a big hole here so that some oxygenated blood can cross and go over here and that helps boost the oxygen level of blood in the lungs um, because obviously the lungs need some oxygen too to help them survive and then it also helps when it returns it, you know, some of the blood actually does go out the aorta and it's more oxygen rich than even though it's very depleted, it's a little bit more because of this VSD. Now, um, there also can be, um, let me just draw this, almost a pulmonary atresia where there's just a little tiny um, pulmonary artery and the valve is stenotic or almost non-existent you know it may not open at all or very little and the only thing feeding the lungs with blood is the PDA which is up here and that PDA needs to remain open at all times in a case like this to help with shunting of blood and getting blood to the lungs um, because at this level it's not doing anything because if the valve if the blood is going up here and there's hardly any flow going through it or it's not there at all which I've seen um, then you need the ductus to keep blood flowing to the to the valves or to the lungs so um, they will give a, a baby what's called prostaglandins to keep that PDA open and then uh, one of the docs will go in usually and do either a surgical procedure to widen the PA, put in a, a usually a you know an, a, a valve of some sort that's deployed. Um, now they can do that a lot. They can deploy a valve through a catheter if it's not obviously if it's not narrowed, but um, you know if they can open up this part of the pulmonary artery, the valve part right here then they could buy the kids some time because a surgeon doesn't really want to work on a heart on an infant if they can. Um, they'd rather work on the heart of a, you know, an adult, or not an adult, I'm sorry, but an older child. So if you can buy the surgeon some time and get the kid to be one year old or so where the chest is a little bit bigger and there's a little more room to work and it's a little easier to do the surgery, then that's what they'll do. So... All right, I thought this was entertaining. Um, it was always referred to on chest x-ray as a 
what they called a boot-like image or a shoe-like image of the heart when a patient has Tetralogy of Fallot. And you can see how someone cleverly has put a shoe in the chest x-ray to show that the apex comes kind of way out here. And when you look at the heart and whole, it almost looks like a shoe. So I just got a kick out of that and thought I'd show you. All right, this is another drawing. Um, you can see a normal heart to the left, obviously, um, how it looks. These are all looking directly into the chest. Um, so it's more of a view that you would see in a subcostal view with it angled a little differently or in a four chamber view in pediatrics. Remember in pediatrics we flip the pictures upside down and make it more anatomically correct. The reason we do that is for the surgeons so that they know what they're dealing with when they get in there. Here you can see on the right um, that there's a obviously a ventricular septal defect here. Here's the septum on the left ventricle. Now here you can see where the pulmonary stenosis is right here in the valve. So this is valvular stenosis, big VSD, which is tetralogy of flow. Now they're pointing out that you have an overriding aorta here, which what they mean by overriding aorta is that the septum looks like this. It comes from here to here. This is really not an overriding aorta, but it's the best picture I could find where it was mentioned. So you'll see the septum come up and kind of go almost to the middle of the aorta rather than to the front of it. So um, that's one other drawing of it. And here we have a long axis view. Now long axis view is similar to the adult view um, in pediatrics. So you see the left atrium, you see the ven big ventricular septal defect, the ven the left ventricle. This is true aortic uh, override. So um, you can see how the tip of the ventricular septum is pointing almost towards the center of the aorta. Um, hold on a second. I keep forgetting to use this. You can see how the tip of it is kind of riding right dead center in the aorta. So this would be like a 50% override. Um, and then the flow would go into the right ventricle. Unfortunately, there's no view of the PA here, but if you had a view of the PA, you wouldn't see the override. So I wanted to show you that that's pretty common to see in uh, tetralogy, so. Okay, so this is a four chamber view. It's not the best one I could find, or well, it is the best one I could find, unfortunately. I wish I had saved some of the images that I got over the 30 years that I took pictures. Um, this is uh, uh, show, showing the big VSD um, that you see in Tetralogy of Fallot. It will be usually up here, but also you can see this in other defects where there's a hole here and a hole here, and we'll get into that later on. But um, what you, I'm sorry, I didn't have this. So here's the big VSD, and then you can see the valves are kind of on the same level. That's from another disease, but. I wanted to show you where most of the time the VSD is uh, placed. So in a four chamber view, this is the view you would be looking at, right? Upside down, the way it should be, and uh, the big VSD that goes through the four chamber view. Now here you can see some colorful Doppler, and you can see that obviously the Doppler going through the pulmonary artery is very turbulent. And there's a big jet of PI here, and um, the valvular flow is aliased here, obviously, because it's blue, and it should be because of the high turbulence, it would be mostly. You can see how it is red here, and so some red here, and that's a sign of turbulence, right? So I don't want to get into Nyquist limits and stuff like that. That's all. Want to do that? Go to a physics class. Um, and don't get me started on my opinion, rather, um, my nasty opinion regarding physics and echo. Um, I'll get into that someday. But here you can see that the pulmonary artery looks a little small, doesn't it? I mean, usually develop, you know, these are usually in thirds. So the PA will be one third, the aorta will be two thirds, and the atrium will be the other, the last third. So this PA is small. Um, 
and the flow going through it is very um, you know turbulent so that's what you'll see in tetralogy of flow you'll see that turbulent flow all right we're running way past the time I wanted to do this but this is a long axis not the best quality but it's a long axis and here's the color flow going through the VSD and you can see that this is a pretty large hole so the color going through it because there's going to be some pulmonary resistance because the pressures in the pulmonary system are going to be higher this isn't real turbulent it's just barely exceeded the you know the limits uh, there's probably some aortic insufficiency here maybe this little jet here can be very eccentric and then you can see the septum looks like it goes right about here and here's the top of the aorta you can see the aorta is enlarged and uh, that's overriding of the aorta too but that's what it looks like in a long axis what the color flow will look like Okay, last but not least, um, tetralogy of flow is a congenital defect that you will eventually see. Sometimes in newborns, sometimes in infants, and rarely in adults. Um, show all abnormalities using zoom feature on your machine. Sample with Doppler uh, the flow through the VSD and pulmonary artery. Use both the pulsed and continuous wave. Um, remember, your job is to get the best images you possibly can so the doctor can make a diagnosis. It's not your job to make the diagnosis. Obviously, I would like for you to know exactly what you're looking at. With time, that will happen. But any abnormality that you see that you can sample or zoom in on or whatever needs to be done, you know, measure the size of the VSD, um, anything like that will help with the doctor's, you know, diagnosis you know our job is to try to make it easier for them even though sometimes it seems like their job is to make it very difficult for us yeah sometimes I don't like doctors but anyhow um, we'll do one more quick slide here and uh, you'll be on your way all right last thing I want to thank Nicole Stewart for her pledge on patreon.com was very generous of her go to patreon if you'd like to make a pledge for my work I'd appreciate it being that I'm old and retired because I got beat up by pushing an echo machine for 30 years I'd like to go into all the stuff that I've had done but we need another seminar for that so if you go to patreon.com and search for Scott Moss that's me or pediatric echo for the adult technologist you'll find my page and there's a way to you know uh, donate if you want make a pledge I'd appreciate it. You guys have a great day, okay? Bye.